this is bittersweet for me. I love, love, love being at Copenhagen speaking. I am very sad I'm not there in person. Uh, Anna feels the same way we were talking about this. Without any further ado then, we are super excited about this talk. Um, so I've been working with Anna for oh, seven years, probably longer than that. And <clears throat> Anna, I'm going to introduce Anna and she's going to cover her ears. Anna is far and away the, the most amazing, talented delivery person I've ever encountered. She has a, an uncanny ability to take large, complex um, delivery uh, operations and, and get them all pointing in the same direction. I'm in awe of this. So <clears throat> we've been working together for a bunch of time and in particular over the last few years with a, a large telco uh, based in India. And we've both been on a very similar journey, which we want to share with you which is, and I'm going to say I've done probably like a full 180 in my thinking with this. Um, I was very much, you know, we need to get beyond this kind of old fashioned, tailorized, uh, linear thinking towards kind of agility and agile thinking. Um, and, and, and that it was very much a beyond towards and an old world and a new world thing. And as we're going to see this morning, um, it, it really isn't that. It's much more of a synthesis. And so that's really what we want to, want to share with you. So the talk is called Agility at Scale, a meeting of mindsets. So let's start then. It's a talk in two parts. Um, the first part, we're going to introduce these two mindsets, uh, what we mean by this, uh, and, and kind of give exemplars of those mindsets. And then in the second part, we want to unpack what some of the implications of that are. So here we have then what we're calling the digital product mindset and, and the industrial mindset. And what I have is want to kind of give a, a, um, an example of both. So what we, what we wanted to do was present that through, through some avatars um, who are exemplars of these two worlds. So in, in the digital product corner, we have Dame Martha Lane Fox. So she is kind of one of the heroes of the very first .NET revolution back in the late 90s, early 2000s. She founded a business called lastminute.com uh, whose product is um, items that are perishable. So things like, or time-based, so things like um, event tickets or restaurant bookings or, or music or those kind of things. And she realized there was a market for matching uh, folks who, who want to get discounted tickets with venues that want to fill seats. And the genius about her business was this, it wasn't necessarily that it was clever tech. I mean, it was great tech at the time, it had to scale, but it's an easy model to, to, to copy. Once I can see that, that, that Martha's doing this thing, matching these products, I can go and do the same thing. But what she also did was she then, she then locked up all of, the, um, uh, all, of the, all of the vendors, if you like, so all of the sports venues and the entertainment venues and the restaurants and the theatres and into exclusive contracts. So by the time anyone thought to copy her, there wasn't anybody left. So it's a great story of commercial and technical insight. So now uh, in the opposing corner, we have uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, uh, personal connection for me, because I went to Brunel University in London, which is a, a, a great engineering university. I did math and computer science there about 100 years ago. So Isambard Kingdom Brunel um, built railways, he built ships, he built bridges. Uh, one of the great industrialists of the Victorian era in, in the UK. And so these folks are going to explain to us uh, how the digital mindset is different from the industrial mindset. So. Uh, for the purposes of this, Anna will voice Martha Lane Fox and I will be Isambard Kingdom Brunel. So, um, so, so let's start then. So, so Martha, please tell us about, um, please tell us about uh, what, 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 it is that you're, what it is that you're doing. How does your world work? So our context, so our world is full of uncertainty. So things are changing really fast. The customers are changing their habits. They're changing how they see things, what they need. So before given that uncertainty, we really need to focus on learning and enable to be optimized the way we work. Okay, so that, that, that worries me. You know, as, a, as an industrialist, that worries me because what I want is low uncertainty. You know, how, how, how on earth would you build a railway if you didn't know how to build a railway? Um, so, so what I want is a well-understood world where 
where, where, where my, my, my context is, is clear and my goals are clear. So, so, so tell me about how, how you measure progress. And what does progress look like for you? So progress for us is actually not measured by how much rail we lay, given you just said um, you're laying the rail, um, or how many features we build in our digital world. Our results are measured by the impact we make on the customer and how can we make them successful. So, <clears throat> so results and customer impact, I mean, this is all great words, but you know, more, more railway is better, right? Bigger bridges are better. Uh, um, bigger ships are better. So, so I, I understand output and I, and I optimize for output. And this, this, this tells me that we're doing good work. If we're, if we're building railways well, then we've had lots of railways. If we're building them slowly, they become more expensive. So, okay, I'm, I'm sure we can meet somewhere. Let's talk about structure. How do you, how do you set yourselves up? Well, so given that we've got a very high uncertainty, as well as what we try to optimize for is the customer impact, we um, organize ourselves around the cross-functional teams. We move people to the work, we get them to solve problems, we make sure that those teams have all the skills that they need in order to uh, solve those problems. We reward gener generalists, uh, meaning that it is very useful for us. Um, we appreciate your expertise, but it's actually very useful if you can get to know what your colleagues in the team are doing, so that way we can collaborate better. Uh, uh, all, this, all this collaboration to me sounds just like goofing off and, and time wasting. Of course, I want to organize by function. Um, I, so I want people who lay tracks to lay tracks. I want people who drive trains to drive trains. I don't understand why someone laying tracks should care about how you drive a train um, so I, I'm afraid in my industrial world, we organize ourselves around function because we're trying to produce output. And, and we believe that, that, that specialists, you, you can spend a lifetime becoming a great engineer and we want to reward that. So, so OK, so all, all of this sounds, I mean, it sounds like we're kind of in different places here. So, so what, what is the goal of what you're doing then? What is, what is the final, what is it you're actually trying to achieve? So what we're really trying to achieve is um, maximize the discovery, meaning that um, the more we learn, the more we understand the context of our customers, um, the better we can build a better product, we can respond to their needs. And we do that through experimentations. So we try different things that we think might work, we see how our customers respond to them, and then we take the learnings and we either double up or we kind of pivot and we do whatever it takes to satisfy their needs. Good heavens, woman. Good heavens, Dame Martha. This, this sounds crazy. So when you say discovery, I hear surprises. When you say experimentation, I hear making it up. I, I can't believe that you can possibly work in this way. I want to minimize variance when, when we're laying railway and it suddenly gets wider in one point or narrower in one point or tunnels are, are, are lower and they're too short for the trains. This is this is crazy. This is this is how accidents happen. So we need to have strict controls. Uh, thank you, Martha. Thank you, Isabel. Um, so so uh, wow. OK, so it seems it seems like these folks are, are poles apart here. So let's <clears throat> let's take a look at this then. This, um, this, the, the, this list, by the way, comes from uh, the gov.uk service manual, which is gov.uk was an initiative um, over the last probably 10 years or so, where, where central government in the UK chose to go on a digital first journey. And in fact, it was Martha Lane Fox as well, was, was one of the inspirations behind this, was to be what they call digital by default and open by default. And what that means is any new government services start online. If you need an analog, like a paper version, that comes later. And the other part was open by default, which means that the software is open, uh, data is open, uses open standards. So most of the software running gov.uk website is actually on GitHub <laughs> under a GDS team, Government Digital Services GDS team uh, account. So, so, so these are, uh, if you look at the, the bit.ly link at the bottom there, GDS governance, this was a piece of work that, that they did around what does it mean to govern projects that act in this digital product way? So, um, so I'm gonna go through these and Anna's uh, gonna offer us some, some uh, examples of what these things mean. So, so, so what was this first one? Don't slow down delivery. What does that mean? Well, don't slow down delivery means that we are gonna do whatever it takes in order to um, optimize for flow. 
So we optimizing the system for the flow of value. Okay, that's okay. Th th these are new words, flow and value. Okay, we're going to need to understand these in a bit, I guess. Um, decisions when they're needed at the right level. This sounds worrying to me. This sounds like we're not really thinking about things ahead of time. How, how does that help us? We are thinking ahead of time at the strategic level. However, when it comes to actually operations and what people do day to day, we want to make sure that decisions are taken what the most information is. And sometimes that information is actually where the team is and um, where they could actually get the feedback from the customer in the real time. Okay. So do it, do it with the right people. That, that seems, that seems, I, I don't understand what, when you say do it with the right people, why would you, how would you do it with the wrong people? <laughs> so um, when we talk about doing it with the right people, we mean having all the people in the team who are able to not only build uh, the railway in, in your example, but not only build the software, but also operate it. So we've got all the skill set required in order for the particular digital product to be successful. So you build it, you run it. This seems like, I'm just, you know, just looking at this as an observer, this seems like an enormous cultural shift, if not a, a shift in like, I don't know, governance and trust. I don't really understand how the people that build it also run it. That, that kind of makes me nervous. Okay, maybe we'll revisit that in a bit as well. What says go see for yourself? What does that mean? That means that the team members, in order to really be able to solve the problems effectively for the customer, they've got to interact with that customer directly. They've got to go and meet that customer, empathize with their needs, understand the problem they're trying to solve. And having that level of insight and knowledge at the team level help them to make much better decisions and choices in order to build good digital products. Wow. So this is, this is you've got, you're literally talking about programmers talking to end users. I do. Wow. So I'm just I'm just trying to imagine some of these large organizations we work with where there are many, many steps of indirection between between those those sets of people. Only do it if it adds value. So so what, what does this only do it if it adds value? What's that about? So that is about really making sure that we look at different types of work that we need to do in order to create value. So um, we recognize that there are different types of value. And in some places, we will choose before doing delivery. We will choose to discover what is that we're trying to build, what is the problem we're trying to solve. We don't just jump into building a big product only because someone says, build me this. We go back to the customer. We understand what is that we're trying to solve for. That also means recognizing that in order to add value, sometimes we have to invest our time in the type of work that is not necessarily direct delivery, but is actually uh, improvements or Kaizen. And it's the changes we have to make within our organization, within the systems that we work in, the processes that we follow, um, in order to make teams more effective, in order to enable the teams to add value. And sometimes those things are around automation. Sometimes those things are about simplifying some of the processes, eliminating waste. So we recognize that we've got to do different types of work to add value, not just do things because they have always been that way. That's interesting because it sounds to me like you're using a broader definition of Kaizen there. I understand Kaizen as being like continuous improvement of like a, a process or a way of working. And, and you're introducing things like automation there and learning as, as Kaizen. That's right. Uh, that, that's right. So what, what we what we realize that um, in the digital organizations, when we're trying to operate at scale, we don't just improve continuously improve the code base. That's not what it is. But we also got to look what kind of system does the teams and that code and that product operate in, and we've got to continuously improve and adapt the way the way we work, the way we structure it, the way we operate, the way things get done in our organization. So that that sounds that's interesting. That sounds like a lot more holistic approach than 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 what we've seen with a lot of uh, agile methods, even a lot of scaling agile methods. This 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 idea of this integration of of process, what people are doing, how they're working, the tools they're using, a whole load of different things. Okay, so this trust and verify. This this sounds this sounds like a contradiction in terms, right? How can you trust and verify? What does that mean? So that means that uh, in order to be able to achieve good outcomes and be successful, we've got to realize that 
we are hiring people to do good work. We are looking for the really talented people. As I mentioned before, they have the expertise. So go back to your language um, in the industrial thinking, they spend their lifetime um, developing their career as an engineer, as a product person, as a delivery person. But now they also actually taken the effort to go and learn other skills, to have the appreciation and understanding of what's happening around them. So if we're hiring such a smart people, then we kind of need to get out of their way uh, meaning that um, if we we cannot we ha we're hiring for talent, we cannot constrain them uh, by uh, our expectations and telling them what to do. So we've got to trust them. So we've got to allow them to do the great work. And the verify comes from there will be a certain points when we expecting certain things to happen in certain way for the strategic or uh, operational reasons. So we want to make sure that uh, there is trust, but within the some level of boundary. This is interesting because this, this this phrase, hire smart people and get out of their way, the first time I heard this was uh, Adrian Cockcroft, who was the head of engineering at Netflix when they moved to the cloud, when they were moved to Amazon. And, and I think it's one of these wonderfully misunderstood phrases. So hire smart people and get out of their way almost sounds like, um, like absent yourself, right? Hire smart people and then just, then you're done. I hired smart people, my work here is done. My understanding of this is when you say get out of their way, it's about getting the organization out of their way. So it's hiring smart people and, and setting them up to be, as you say, because you hire these smart people, it's about letting them do work. How can we get the organization out of their way? How can we take our incumbent processes and, and procurement's a famous one, hiring's another one, where or reviews or people, all this sort of people stuff, where we have these very archaic, time-consuming processes and, and that just gets in people's way. So I think this idea of hiring smart people and getting out of their way, that's really intriguing for me. So, so that's great. Now let's take a look uh, at how these industrial habits, our incumbent industrial habits clash with, with these, these clearly quite sensible product principles. So you know, we talk about not slowing down delivery and yet we have release coordination, which is often trying to, to bring things together. Um, CAB, the, the Change Advisory Board from ITIL. The word advisory in there is like it's a, it's a, it, <laughs> the clue's in the name. It's supposed to be something that advises on process. Uh, I've seen a lot of organizations where the A becomes approval. So Change Approval Board. So now they are a step, you know, they're, 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 they're a, a road hump that you have to, or a gate you have to get through in order to get stuff delivered. And you have uh, what I've heard described as release theater, where, where everyone gets together and, that they discuss something they couldn't possibly know what the details of it are, and then they all nod sagely and then send it on its way, or or someone comes up with some, you know, bike shedding kind of. Well, I think that the button should be slightly to the left, and let's send it back, um, kind of thing. Decisions where they're needed. Um, I <laughs> I wish I saw that. Again, I generally see upfront technical and visual design work. I see a lot of work breakdown, and again, in an industrial context, this makes sense, right? If you are um, laying uh, fiber you know, for, for broadband, or if you are uh, installing masts for, for 4G or 5G telecoms, then, then you need to do an awful lot of upfront work. I want to see a Gantt chart for that. Henry Gantt was a very smart man. He, he built factories with, with Henry Ford. Um, so, so from an industrial perspective, that we, we want to be front loading a lot of that risk. And so if we're, if, we're leave, if we're deferring decisions in that way, that, that should concern us. Doing it with the right people. Uh, again, I often see specialist activities happening outside of the team. And, and, and in, in, a, in an industrial context, that might make sense. If I'm building medical products, I probably want my, you know, some, some kind of uh, healthcare regulatory specialist. That's a, again, you, you, you're, you're probably someone who's a, a, a practicing medical professional who's going to be that advisor and so that necessarily happens outside of the team but then then i guess we start seeing things like uh info set you know information security happening outside the team or compliance happening outside the team or you know um your 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 you build it you run it uh, operations happens outside of the team the 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 the, the make and the operator separate functions um go see for yourself uh this idea, you know, we separate business and IT, and within IT, you separate engineering from operations, and in operations, you separate uh, support from infrastructure, and you have this kind of bifurcations of responsibility. 
And that creates all of these handoffs and gates and barriers. And then suddenly, you know, no, no one sees anything for themselves. And I, I, I'm a, I'm a 30 year programmer, you know, and I remember a lot of my career has felt a lot like take data out of system A, munge it, stick it into system B, you know, in a bank rather than make it easier for a, uh, a homemaker in Dusseldorf to get money out to do her weekly shop, right? And and that's you know, again I'm not not realizing the value chain and not understanding who the customer is. Only do it if it adds value. Um, sure, I'd lo- I'd love to only do stuff that adds value. I can think of uh, business processes that are eye watering and painful, and we just do it because it's there. And I think it was uh, one of the Dave Thomases. There, there are several Dave Thomases. One of the Dave Thomases describes this as organizational scar tissue. You know, we have layers and layers of process because that is what we do. Because one time back in the 90s, this bad thing happened. And so we added a step to the process that we've never gone back and revisited. And then the trust to verify, again, we introduce more process when things go wrong. And this, um, this is, as, as I was saying, this, this, um, I, I've never seen any process go away, right? And this is an active uh, initiative to, to, to cut down on that process. I've never seen anyone say, you know what we need here? We need fewer steps. So, so it seems to me, uh, Anna slash Martha, um, that, that we, we, th- these things are at odds with each other. So, so how, can we, how can we integrate these, these mindsets? Let's, let's take this back to Martha. So, so uh, so, so what, what what are your teams doing then, Martha? So, um, what my teams are doing, they're actually owning the product. So, um, as we discussed earlier during the principal section, the products built and run um, they own applications. And what that does, it just really helps them. It makes them a better drivers. They carry the pager when things go wrong. They get a full, they take a full accountability and ownership of what they build, and they fix the issue. And in a highly iterative, highly evolving context, I can I can totally imagine that being a good idea. From my industrial perspective, I think I can help. So we can we can build and run your runtime as a product. So we can we we can think about the runtime, the operating environment for your product is itself a product, and we can make and operate that. And that's going to give you the scaling. That's going to give you the standardization. That's going to remove a whole load of repetitive. Um, non-value adding activities that your product teams are going to need that seems like a pretty sensible way to way to go so 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 what about um uh um agency then what about the what, what are your folks actually doing so we empower the teams to make decisions at the local level, but also to adapt to the local conditions. We realize that there is a value in some degree of freedom. So when teams actually are able to solve the problems for themselves, uh, given the local context, it really helps them to be more effective and more successful. That's fantastic. So, so, so we've got, you know, I, I, I can imagine any kind of reasonable size organization you're going to have product teams in very, very different contexts, some more customer facing, some more internally facing, some more operational. And, and so we don't want to impose a one size fits all. What's, what, how can we industrialize this? Well, for, from, a, from a scaling perspective, we can, uh, I, lo- I, love, I like using the phrase making it famous, right? So Anna is in her product team doing something brilliant. She's also super busy, right? And she's going on to the next thing after she's done this brilliant thing. Now, that means that we're having good ideas across the organization all the time, but they are always point solutions. You know, we, we, don't, we don't capitalize on that. So instead, what if we had a group of people whose job is to go and find all of those Annas and find all of that brilliant work they're doing, harvest it and amplify it, make it famous. So rather than your central uh, I know, enterprise architecture team or whatever you call that thing or innovation group or whatever, they're not the folks who come up with the ideas. That's a, that's a crazy inefficiency. They are the people who go out into the organization where these ideas are coming out all the time. And yes, I do have a small yappy dog. Um, they're having these great, these great ideas all the time. And, um, and so what we want to do is, is reuse those. 
And so we are going to do the work to add the tests, to document it, to add the tutorials, to uh, provide the internal consulting around those great ideas. So that way we can scale innovation without, without slowing it down. So, so let's talk about governance then, the, the, the G word. Okay, let's talk about, the, let's talk about governance. What, how, how, do you, how do your teams govern themselves? So we um, allow the teams to actually track and report their own progress. So that allows the teams to uh, reflect on their own performance and also report back how they're doing. Very often, we just define the kind of metrics we're interested in and we say, okay, tell us how well you're doing on the, metro on the following metrics. And how you get that, that is absolutely up to you. And this, again, goes back to adapting to local conditions, I guess. And then from a scaling perspective, from a from a... Um, from an industrial mindset perspective, we, we, we define what those overall expectations are. Uh, a real example, um, Anna and I, when we first met a few years ago at a large uh, retailer in the UK, and we said it was a very simple set of, set of metrics. We said, we want to know how much stuff you're doing, how long a thing is taking, and how much stuff you have in flight right now. So in other words, lead time, uh, throughput, and work in process or load. And lead time and working process are the, are the, are the key ones. So, uh, so sorry, lead, lead time and throughput are the key ones. So how much stuff are you producing? But also how old is that stuff? Right? If you're delivering something that someone asked for 18 months ago, they probably don't care anymore. So that gave us a really good insight into, and the teams a really good insight into what work they were doing and how they were prioritizing. The working process was more like an internal lever for them. But right? once they realized that by reducing their work in process, they could massively increase throughput and reduce lead time. Guess what? They started reducing their work in process. So that was more of a visualization tool. But what we said, and this was Anna's insight, she said, I, I don't care. I don't care what the teams do. I don't care if they're doing Scrum or Kanban or making it up. Right? All I care is that on a regular two-week pulse, then we're going to get these numbers. And, and it, took, it was a bit of a rocky road. <laughs> it was a bit bumpy. Um, but then we had things like visualizations where the whole any team could see what the whole all the other teams were working on at a very high level. And that gave that that produced a huge amount of alignment around um, direction, which is rather lovely. So, OK, so all, all of this, all of this looks like fun. So so uh, th this, it's almost like this needs a, this needs a name, this thing. And that's what we what we really learned that bringing those two mindsets together uh, creates autonomy through alignment. So we can't just achieve those very famous uh, word autonomy and alignment that we hear all the different places. We can't achieve that just by simply being like every everyone runs free is about autonomy, is the digital mindset. We actually need to leverage the elements of the um, industrial mindset to really help us to achieve it. So in the second part of the talk, we would like to cover autonomy through alignment and we would like to really unpack those terms in order to understand what they mean and uh, how can we achieve them? Because it's all nice to say like, oh, it seems autonomous, but what does it mean? How do they get there? Or like we need to get an um, organizational alignment. What does it take to be aligned and who needs to do that? So that's the second part. So firstly, we're going to look at alignment. And when it comes to alignment, it is defined by being in line on agreement with others, but alignment of what? And this is where we've learned that we need to look at the alignment from four different perspectives. Is alignment of product, so what problem are we solving and for whom, being completely clear on that product vision, is also the alignment of the technology vision. So do we have the right vision in place to ensure that the teams are making good decisions and they're confident that other teams are making good decisions too? Is the alignment of approach? So organizationally, we're very clear about what are the metrics that we're measuring? What is the, the way that we work? Uh, how are we introducing change? How are we improving those processes? How does this organizational Kaizen actually happen? And the last one is the alignment of focus. So it's all great to have a very far in the future vision for our product and for our technology. But the important question to us is how are we getting there? What is the next thing we need to focus on? What are we doing uh, today? What are we doing in the next month, in the next quarter, in the next year? So it's really looking at focusing our effort in order to achieve and move us towards that product technology um, and approach vision. 
So when we talk about all of those different elements, the big question is, okay, that's all great, but who owns them? Who creates them? And this is where in the large organizations, we really see that it requires the leadership to step in. The product, the technology, the practice and delivery leadership. And all of them no longer being just, you know, separate silo leaderships when everyone defines their own visions, but they actually need to not only very clearly define what is that um, their visions are, but also they've got to make sure it is a cross-cutting leadership and holistic. So we defining the vision for the product that is in line with the vision for technology that is supported by the delivery practices, as well as all the other practices across the organization, whether that's engineering, whether that's design, whether that's product. And they all, all of these leaderships speak with one voice. And that's incredibly important. So we don't get situations when we go to different leaders in order to get the answer we want because we didn't want that, that answer that leadership gave us. Uh, and what that really creates is that uh, holistic and unity that helps the organization to move in the desired direction together. And the next thing that we've got to think about is like, okay, we've got those visions, we've got the leadership that has really stepped up, is giving up some great stuff. How do we cascade this? Because the leaders having a great vision doesn't necessarily ensure that the rest of the organization does. And where we're really trying to get to is that we make sure that if anyone in the organization who can actually answer the question, what that vision is, why are we building this product? How are we working around here? What is that we're working on next? So we achieve that cascading of the vision through the strategy, so product technology strategy, through very clear ways of working, as well as the OKRs. So anyone and everyone knows where, they, where they're going. So what we see on the left-hand side in the owned by, that is our structure. So that is the structure of the long-lasting and adaptive leadership because life happens, changes happen, unexpected things like the pandemic happens that require us to pivot. And we can only effectively pivot and change and be, um, when I say agile, but really have that business agility at that organizational scale if we have a holistic leadership. And when it comes to the direction is uh, it allows all of the organization to move in the desired direction and for the same reason. So if that summarizes the alignment through which we can only achieve autonomy, let's unpack the autonomy next. So when we talk about autonomy, the definition is being independent of other parts or <clears throat> other organisms. And what we um, discovered through unpacking those terms and working with large organizations is that there is few things that is required in order for the autonomy to be, effective autonomy to be in place. It's not just a free run for everyone. So autonomy requires, first of all, an objective. So really being very clear about what are we doing and why. So the teams have that clarity of, okay, this is our goal. This is what we're trying to achieve. And everyone is pointing that direction. The next thing we require is constraints. And when we talk about a constraints, it's, it's like the rules of the road. So those are the enabling as well as the governing constraints. So this is for the organization to be very clear and, and set very clear expectations. What are the things that we're putting in place in order to help you to deliver value faster? And what are the things that we absolutely require you to do for a very, very good reasons um, in order to ensure that we have that alignment? The next thing is accountability. And here we've got the accountability of what, so are we doing the right thing, as well as the accountability of how, so are we doing it right? Um, and I'm not gonna unpack it any further, but holistically here what we have is the demand side. So is what is that we are um, required to do in order to really be effectively autonomous? There are three more things that we need um, and they come on the supply side and that is capability. So when we talk about the capability, do our autonomous teams have everything they need in terms of not only skills, because that's very often 
uh, simplified to say capability is just your skill, but actually there's much more than skills. It's also the information, it's also the experience, uh, it's also a context. So in order to achieve certain objectives, we actually require not only people with a good skill, but we might actually, so for example, a good product managers, but we might say, you know what, we really require someone with an in-depth in -depth retail experience. And that's also a capability. So given the teams, the complex problems and saying, yeah, autonomous, go and solve it without the right levels of capability that is understood at the greater depth, it might just not be viable. Next thing we need is resources. And by resources, we mean the physical and digital stuff. So those are things like, you know, the teams might require funding and they might require some hardware, they might require some software, some applications, infrastructure. So then that's autonomy requires easy access to those things. And the next one is authority. And authority is really having the permission to do the things you need to do in order to be successful. And that takes us to what we discussed earlier, making the decisions at the right level and moving the decisions to where the information is so that the teams have the authority to make the right decision at the right time. And as I mentioned earlier, this sums up the supply side. So the su supply side being what is that we need in order to be autonomous. And before we moved on, I just wanted to amplify one thing is that what we've learned is this is no either or, or this is not pick and choose. This is not something that you set up and say from now on you run autonomous. What this really is, is you need all of those in place. And if one of them changes, it will have impact on all the other ones. So there is a very close correlation as well as um, interaction between those elements. So for example, if we're asking a team to go after a different goal about different objectives over different problem they might need different skills they might need different type of resources they might actually require to make certain decisions they have not been making yet so each of them will interact with one another and impact on one another right so <clears throat> so so if the goal changes right if the game changes then then the way you need to play the game changes so uh, if we look at if we go back and think about the alignment side we're saying we're going to have alignment of the product, of the what, alignment of technology, alignment of ways of working, alignment of, of direction, alignment of um, delivery, near-term goals. And once I have those, we're saying that autonomy then requires all six of these things. They are all, uh, and again, Anna and I have iterated on this a lot over the last few years. Um, I think the, the, the statement we would make now is that they are all necessary and sufficient. So in other words, if you take any one of these away, you are no longer autonomous. You can do that as a thought experiment. If we don't have constraints, imagine we said, okay, we're, we're not gonna tell you which side of the road to drive on, go. Right? <laughs> that's, that's not gonna last very long. If we say, you know, uh, we're gonna have red lights and green lights at intersections, but we're not gonna tell you what they mean, right? <laughs> Get off you go, carry on, right? This, 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 is, not, this is not a way to be autonomous. It's a way to, to cause uh, chaos. So. So it's really important then that we have all of these things. And, and this then leads to a model where we say, well, if, if we don't have these things, what does it mean? And some years ago, uh, Chris Matz, who's uh, a former business analyst, colleague of mine from ThoughtWorks from many years ago, um, has become very much a kind of product and uh, operational um, guru. And he talked about skills liquidity. He originally called it staff liquidity and then called it skills liquidity which is so liquidity is a financial term. It means how available something is. So cash is very liquid. I can just pick up some cash and spend it. Whereas uh, shares that are locked into a company that I can't sell, that's, I might have that wealth. I, I, you know, I technically own those shares and they're worth something, but I can't do anything with them. So they're not liquid. So liquidity is how easy it is to get hold of something. And what I've done is taken this idea of skills liquidity and broadened it out to the whole of autonomy. So if we think of each element in autonomy as an asset, so the objective, the constraints, the accountability, the capability, resources, authority, each of those are an asset. And I, and I can look at those assets uh, or the team can look at their own assets and they can say, well, team, do we have the resources we need? Are we low on resources? Do we have a clear objective, right? Do we have, do we understand the constraints? In other words, can we make good decisions that are likely to be aligned with Anna's team's decisions. Because Anna's a very smart lady and she's gonna make good choices. However, 
she might not make the same choices I would because she doesn't, she's not using the same rules as me because no one told either of us the rules. She's worked in different places. She has different experiences. Her team has a different context. So what looks like a good decision in her context may be an absolute disaster at scale. We don't know this. Or it may be very poorly. She might decide to drive on the left and I might decide to drive on the right. And, and they're, both, they're both perfectly reasonable choices and then bad things are going to happen and it was no one's fault. So we need to understand that we have sufficient constraints, sufficient accountability. You know, are we keeping ourselves honest? And so on. And so then we look at the liquidity of each of those. How easy is it to obtain anything we're missing? Or how easy is it to change anything we're missing? And, and then based on that liquidity, that then steers a strategy for us. And of course, liquidity is a function of time. It may be that resources are very hard to come by now, but they'll become easier in the future or vice versa. So we as a team need to be continually reviewing our autonomy liquidity. And then our strategy then kind of falls out of that discussion. So we can say, is it easy to obtain? Go get some. Uh, Python, right? My team needs some Python programming skills. I, I reckon any, any half decent engineer can learn Python in days and become reasonably good at it in weeks. It's a very straightforward, accessible language. It may be that the skill we need is pricing exotic derivatives or understanding endocrinology, right? Now, that's a much less liquid skill. I can't just go learn me some endocrinology. That's not gonna happen. So, so that's, that's, that, that's not so easy to obtain. So now if something's harder to obtain, maybe I can go and hire some. Right? I can borrow some by you know, renting some, some kit or by bringing in a, an advisor or an expert or a consultant or something for a short period of time. That might help me. And again, this may be a bridging decision. It may be that I'm going to borrow some uh, skills or some capability or some authority for a period as I grow my own internal um, asset there and create my own liquidity. But finally, if it's not possible, you know, this is the... God grant me the, 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 the courage to change the things I can, um, the, the strength to, to suck up the things I can't and the wisdom to know the difference or something. And if, if I know something's impossible to change, then let me rethink the problem. So let's not beat our head against the wall. And, and again, it's always for now, right? Because all these things are time-based. It's um, if, if something's impossible for now, can we work around it for now and leave a marker that we worked around it? Because maybe we might want to come back and revisit that at some point in the future. And so given this or this sort of model of autonomy liquidity, that now gives us effectively an operating model at a team scale to be able to operate effectively and know that as that rolls up, we know that across the organization, everyone's going to continue facing in the same direction, which is super exciting. And, and back to back to what we're talking about autonomy through alignment. We need both autonomy and alignment. If we if we don't have autonomy, if we just have alignment, then we have autocracy. We have people being told what to do with no agency, with no ability to make their own choices within that. That's autocracy. That leads to low morale. That leads to high attrition. That leads to sad people. It usually leads to poor outcomes. But conversely, and this is the, 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 the pendulum swing that we see going massively the other way, we go, we're going agile, is they just throw out all the governance. <laughs> we have autonomy or the, 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 uh, the illusion of autonomy without alignment. Um, and, and, and that leads to anarchy. There was a, um, there's a wonderful, so G.K. Chesterton, who was a poet and writer in the early 20th century, he, he proposed a thought experiment. It's known as Chesterton's fence. And it goes like this. He says, there's a fence across a road. You come across a road and someone's put a fence across the road. And you think, that's a bit odd. Why would someone put a fence across the road? And so you move the fence because clearly no one would put a fence across the road. And then something really bad happens. And, and his, 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 uh, his point is this, is that when you see something that looks odd to you, it's quite possible that that thing makes perfect sense if you understand the context. It's just you that doesn't have context rather than the fence that's wrong. And so the Chesterton's fence principle is when you see something that looks unusual to you, seek first to understand, right? Go and find out the story of the fence. How did the fence get there? And that will give you the information to decide what you're doing. And I see so many organizations where uh, anything hashtag no, Hashtag no projects, hashtag no managers, hashtag no estimates. 
And that generally comes from a position of, I don't understand why X exists. I haven't walked a mile in X's shoes. No managers says, I don't understand why organizations need someone who is looking at how the organization works rather than shipping stuff, right? And when you've worked in an organization where that wasn't, where, where, where that was poor or lacking, suddenly you understand the, the, the need for it. So autonomy without that alignment then is anarchy, it's just people running around doing crazy stuff. And Henrik Knieberg, who, who was uh, consulting at, um, uh, at Spotify back in the day, probably nearly 10 years ago now, um, does these wonderful illustrations. He's now, he's, now, he's now playing Minecraft for a living. I mean, that's not a bad gig. Um, and he drew this lovely picture. He talks about high and low alignment, high and low autonomy, and this pointy-haired boss that you might recognize from Dilbert. And in this bottom left organization, uh, you've got like micromanaging and indifferent culture and no one cares. And we want to move to this top right, you know, we need to cross the river with like lovely commander's intent. I don't know, you know, you can build a bridge, you can do boats, you can do, I don't care how you do it, but build, a, build a pontoon while you build the bridge, you know, do, do go figure stuff out. I trust you, you're smart people. And off they go. And so they're aligned, they're happy, they're motivated and they're trusted. So, okay, this is all great, but something that Anna and I are big fans of is, is having practical tools. So, so um, we want to share something with you now that you can kind of take away and, and, and hopefully use. So when we started with all of this, um, and we just placed here on the slide a few questions that you can go around and uh, really ask the people at different levels, because you've got to always start with where you are. And some of those questions are around that everyone really understands the strategy, not just leadership, but actually everyone in the team. Uh, do people know how to work? Do they have the tools they need? Do they have the experience they need? Um, do we have the OKRs that are cascading up and down? And how autonomous do the teams actually feel on each of those elements we described? So in order to help you with that, we have created, um, you could call it a survey, but just something on the one page. You can see all of those elements and you can actually decide what is your level of alignment and the level of autonomy for all of those um, different elements we have discussed today. And the key thing here is that uh, you're going to discover that there is many, many different problems that you have. But what is very useful here is the theory of constraint approach. When you actually really start identifying what is your bigger impediment, your biggest impediment, they might be 60 things to fix. But what will be the top one, two, three that you will go off for, uh, sorry, go after? How would you address them? And also what difference would they, would they actually make? Because it's very easy with this kind of thing to keep ourselves busy. But are we actually making the difference? Are we actually delivering value? And before I hand over to Daniel to sum up, I just wanted to share with you an example from a recent weeks when we were actually talking to um, business vertical and uh, we're discussing different things that uh, have been not going right what they're trying to achieve and they were so 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 focused that the thing that they need to focus on is capability is to having the engineers at the right levels um, with the right skills and that's what they really need to do. They've got to really understand what engineers they have, et cetera. And through the conversation, we very quickly realized that, yes, sure, you can focus on that and you can fix that. You can understand what skill set and what capabilities you have. But without having a very clear alignment and division for like, what are we building? Why are we building this? What are our technology choices we need to make? How do we want to work? How do we want to structure our teams? It's becoming a bit of a pointless exercise that will keep us busy for a very long time. Or maybe not pointless, but the exercise that will only allow you to show progress, do something, but will not make the difference at the bottom line. Because, and I think that's where our understanding of you only achieve autonomy through alignment because unless we have the alignment of where are we moving all together, we can then start adapting and creating those requirements for autonomy to make sure that, you know what, given this product vision, given this technology choices we are making, 
the following skills is what we require, the following experience will be required. Then we can go and then we can look at the experience and the skills that we have to say, oh my God, we have a massive gap in the next six months. We really have got to employ more designers because we're going to have a very, very heavy pipeline that will be doing a lot of discovery work because our product vision is to move to the new market. And without that understanding of that alignment part, it's very hard to then make those adjustment on the autonomy side. Just one example for very recent weeks for you. Fantastic. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> so, so I'm going to sum up very quickly then, because I want to see if we leave a couple of minutes at the end for, for some questions. So we're saying that to achieve agility at scale is a meeting of mindsets. You don't scale agile. You know, scale agile frameworks are just agile vocabulary laid over whatever it was you were already doing. You know, nothing changes. Um, you can't scale agile. What you can do, though, is you can enable agility at scale. And how do you do that? You enable agility at scale by autonomy, and that autonomy comes through alignment. And this requires a synthesis of industrial and digital product thinking. It's not one is better than the other or one is beyond the other. They're different and they're both useful. The alignment piece comes through the structure and direction that, that Anna was describing earlier of the various leadership groups and the holistic kind of leadership, and then the various ways in which those are communicated and, and articulated into the organization. An autonomy then comes to managing that liquidity across those six elements and being aware that they exist, being aware of thinking about how you can measure them, even if it's in a very informal way uh, and having strategies for managing uh, where, where, where you're lacking on any of those, either on the demand side or the supply side. And that's really what we wanted to talk about this morning.